Yes, please. If you would remove item number six, the approval of the Brian Pond Road parking lot project. Next, approve the minutes. Uh, number one, the minutes, 15th, 2021. So moved. I have a motion second. by Gary and a second by Judy. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I will just change that with me. Okay. The minutes are passed. Number two, the minutes of November 15th. Town plan public Plans hearing. So moved. Motion by Judy. Second. Second by Gary. Is there any further discussion on these? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The minutes are moved. I'll abstain on that one, please. That okay. yeah. If you would speak right up so we capture that because Sarah's had yeah. a hard time hearing. Brian abstained on those two because he wasn't present. Yeah. Number three, the minutes of November 18th, 2021, the informational meeting. So moved. Motion by Judy. Second. Second by Gary. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on these? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, the minutes of November 22nd. This is a lot of meetings going yeah. on. The minutes of <laughs> no November good. 22nd. <clears throat> so moved. Moved by Gary. Second by Second. Second by Judy. Any further discussion on these? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Last one, minutes of November 29th, 2021, budget no. meeting for highway. So moved. Motion by Judy. Second. Second by Gary. Any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is passed. All right, next, uh, community concerns. Do we have community concerns tonight? Go ahead, ma'am. Can you please. Um, Yep, state your name, whatever your community concern is. No, um, if, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. If it's about the mask mandate, it is an agenda item, and when we get to that, there will be public right. comment then. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, is there any other community concerns other than the mask mandate discussion? I do have a question. Go ahead, ma'am. All right. Um, when it comes down to being able to. Oh, could you tell us your name, please? Yes, I'm Gianna Rose. Um, when it comes down to being able to have a place for us to be able to compost. Our food and scraps. Is there something that the board that the town is willing to help provide that for? Because I know it's it's regulated on the state side right now. That's a good question. Thank you. I don't think we've had that question before. Do we have anything out at the transfer station? Yes. What, is there, there's a composting bin out there. There's bins out at the compost at the one on the Cochran Road down stall. That's six days a week down there. We have a big trailer down there. Is there education about the residents of this town to make sure they know how to compost their waste? There's handouts if people come and get them. We have them at the transfer station. The one on the Cock Road. From? Well, the Cochrane Road one is, is run by the district, which is the town's member. And the one we own the one on the Cochrane Road, and the district runs it. And that's only open on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. There's one in Johnson's open three days. Mm -hmm. So you're saying only one day a week residents of this town can go propose, dispose of their compost waste? No, no. If they go to the Cochran Road, okay. they can come to Stowe any day they want. That's part of the district. Okay. So that all the sites are 12 towns to get together. Mm -hmm. So any one of the sites you want to use, you can use. Is there facilities available for those who have businesses here, not just the residents? You can bring it there, but we don't have. You mean they don't? We don't pick it up. You you have to bring it to us. Uh, I'm sure there's people out there though. If you for a business, it would come and gladly take it away. So, but I'm not sure on that. Thanks for the question. Is there any other community concerns? All right, seeing none. We'll move to liquor control. Do we have liquor control tonight. We do. We do. Make a motion to go in. All right, I have a motion to move into the liquor control. Second. And a second by Judy. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
We are now in liquor control. Sarah, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. So um, we do have one liquor license. It's actually a new application from Four Timber LLC that's doing business as Tacos and Tap Bar at 82 Lower Main Street, where El Toro used to be. Okay. Jason, do you have any issues with that? So since October 17th, we have been there four times uh, for the lady noise complaints. We have issued two tickets so far for the violating the noise ordinance. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to Paul about that. That's the only, that's the issue that we have on our end. It's not really something that we've dealt with in the past, but Tom, Star, anywhere else has done so I just want to be sure of that. This is something that we're going to do. Right. Would you have a recommendation for us as far as the liquor control, liquor license? I was thinking possibly to do like a six month trial, something like that, just to make sure that we're not going to have any continuing problems. That sounds good. Thank you. <clears throat> any feedback from the board? I was surprised they didn't ask for outside consumption since that was the. El Toro had outside consumption before, right? Yeah, I think they did. I believe so. Yeah. They did before, but I don't know. Maybe going into winter, they haven't asked for it. Or maybe they're going to come back. I don't know. Paul's here. Oh, there you how are you, are you sir? Yes. Can you introduce yourself for us? Hi, I'm Paul. I'm serving tacos and taps. Yeah. So I did not apply for the outdoor consumption because we were going into winter. And the liquor license that I am purchasing is going to be good. I was recommended by the DLC to just get a six month one, anyways. Because I, uh, it comes up in April, I would have just not. Before there would be outside consumption anyway. Exactly. So that's why I just went with the six months. And I want to say, since the two times that I know one of the incidences was this uh, certain individual who brought the firearm in and was being disruptive, ended up going home, and a few nights later called. From my understanding, it was him who called, and then. Was he the one with the uh, the drugs laying on the sidewalk? No. Because in the paper it said the individual that was removed an hour and a half earlier called and said there was drugs on the sidewalk, which turned out to be oatmeal. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I didn't kick anybody else out, so I don't know who wrote that. Assuming it's probably in. It was in a blotter, so. And then the first one was the neighbor next door, which since then I've talked and we. We have an understanding. She just assumed that I didn't care. That was not the case. I do care, and I understand she's right above. So since then, I put in nine inches of blue board plus three inches of uh, marina wool in between those. Didn't have any issue with that. The second ticket came, and I I showed them what I did all the windows. I, mean, I spent almost a thousand dollars in insulation just for the windows, and then I was told by Officer Chris that. Uh, it was coming out of the front. So I can't insulate the whole front of the building and be just a black hole inside. And blue board on the outdoor, you know, it's not gonna be a good look on Main Street either. So uh, what we've done since then is gone at 10 o'clock, anybody that wants to continue playing music went down to the one mic, which the artists play acoustically. And we haven't had an issue since, so. Like I said, the biggest issue has been the noise and Paul, a trumpet, you know, put me out a hundred bucks and then uh, a cat with a pedal of steel banging out at, at like 10, 20, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, got me a $200 ticket. So I understand and, you know, if I'm a neighbor and I, you know, I'm, you know, not wanting to hear music at 10, 30 at night, you know, I, I get that. So I'm, I'm really trying to work with everybody, everybody uh, to alleviate. This is a meeting in Morrisville. I'm sorry. Somebody's not muted. We'll take care of it. Yeah, so, you know, and I, I understand, you know, uh, you know, Tom doesn't have this issue. Tom's been there for a while, and a lot of folks have moved out of apartments, and then new folks move in, understanding there's a bar across the street. I don't have that right now. I have that the bees knees who played, you know, duos and trios for the most part, stringed instruments. Then El Toro, which I ran the bar there for the first three years. We had music. We closed at nine. I'm tacos and taps. I closed at 
close. I'm illegally allowed to serve till two, but if nobody's there at 11 o'clock, I'm closing. But if there's musicians that want to play, what we're going to do is just go down acoustically after 10 o'clock. The noise ordinance is, is till 10. And that's the best I can do without just closing up shop at 10 o'clock and wasting another two, three hours that I can make some money off of a liquor license that I, you know, pay fifteen hundred dollars a year for. So I'm a bar and I'm not a family restaurant and it is legal to have a bar and I understand the noise perspective. So I'm, I'm trying to work with that. Right. Jason, awesome. are you satisfied with that? Oh, yeah, I think six months sounds good to me. Ma'am, go ahead. Are we allowed to have a bar in Morrisville? Yeah. There's one already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've had many bars here in the past. Yeah. How about the board? Do you have any questions or comments? No, I just I'll uh, make the motion that we approve the liquor license for six months. Okay, I have a motion by Gary. I'll second it. A second by Brian. Is there any further discussion on this? Yes, this is Sarah. Um, ahead, just Sarah. so that you know, um, we're kind of less than six months into this. It's only through April 30th. So if you approve this uh, license, this liquor license as is, it's basically going to be for five months. It, he'll ha he'll have to come and renew it um, at the beginning of the year anyways for the May 1st date. Okay. Just kind of a technicality. but That should be in a motion then, right? So I think if you approve it as is, then um, it's less than six months. So I don't think you would need that in your motion. Okay. okay. And then you can have this discussion again in a couple months when he renews, if you decide to approve it. Okay, thanks, Sarah. All right, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Is that all we had tonight, Sarah? Yes. Okay, do I hear a motion to come out of electric control? So moved. Motion by Brian. Second. Second by Judy. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are now back in the regular select board meeting. New business. Uh, first is review the audit with the auditor. Yep. Uh, is the auditor here tonight? Yeah. Bonnie is online. Bonnie Dow was our auditor this year from last Oh, yeah, I see her. Yep. Hi, Bonnie. Can you hear us? I, I can. Um, our audit partner, John Mudgett, has not logged in yet, but um, we can go ahead and get started. He kind of planned on me um, handling most of the discussion anyway. He was just going to be available for any other questions and just to sit in on the meeting as well so he could meet you all. Okay. Um, Does anybody have questions about it? Did you have a comment, Bonnie? Um, I was just going to mention um, when I was preparing this afternoon for the meeting and I was looking through the audit report, um, I did notice a, kind of like a typo it's, or a printing error on page 33. One of the tables is cut off. So we're going to get you guys a revised um, final document that fixes that one minor thing that I picked up on today. Okay. Yeah. It's the table in note seven, right. just the left hand side, oh. a couple of letters got cut off on the whole table. I'm not okay. sure what happened there, but we'll okay. get that corrected for you. Okay. So is, do you want to comment on the opinion of the audit? Um, yeah, I just have a couple of like highlights of things that I can mention and discuss unless you guys have specific questions for us relating to the the audit or the reports or anything contained within them. The I opinion know. on the financials. I'm sorry, what was that? I don't have any questions. I just wanted to, you know, to sort of elaborate on that opinion. You, you yeah. Have. Um, the opinion on the financial statements was unmodified um, with what used to be called a, a clean opinion. 
um, there's nothing within the, the financial statements that are that's material mis materially misstated. Um, Tina has a really good handle on everything that she does in the finance office. And um, it was a really, really smooth audit, even though it was a, a first year for us. We were somewhat familiar with you guys having done it a few years back. We'll but, see. That works. Um, but overall, it went pretty smoothly. And we were in your office for about a week in September to do the majority of the field work. Um, the opinion on internal control over financial reporting was also unmodified and we don't have any findings related to your internal controls and the testing that we did. Okay. Yes, I don't have any questions. Do you, Gary? I have none though, Brian. No. We've always been um, in the past, it's been brought to our attention that we need to carry more un un unallocated funds. Do you feel that way too? Um, I don't think so. I think you have a, a pretty good amount of unassigned fund balance in your general fund at the end of this year. Um, I know I've talked with Tina a little bit since year end about some planned uses um, here and there and some questions on the fund balances in general, but I think you guys have a pretty healthy fund balance that could be utilized if something unexpected were to come up. The other question I have, I, I kind of always ask the auditors this question is, um, is there anything that we can do to be more transparent with everything that we do? Because that's always, that's always a question, you know, you hear about all over the place, not just, um, not just Vermont or whatever, across the country, you always hear about these situations where municipal offices have embezzling happening and that, and that sort of thing. And um, certainly not to shed any, any ill thoughts of any one of us, but is there anything we can do to be more transparent? Um, there isn't anything specific that comes to mind. Um, I know Tina has a really good handle on, on how organized she is and, and where everything is. I think there's good, good knowledge between her and her assisting staff to keep things going if one of them needed to be out and there's a second set of eyes looking at, looking at things on a regular basis. Um, there definitely wasn't anything I picked up on during the audit because I had no audit findings or recommendations. Mm -hmm. and she's definitely available and, and quick to respond. Um, we did our planning remotely and she was right on top of her email and, and answering questions quickly and, and made sure she was prioritizing getting everything that we needed to us. Sounds great. All right, do you need anything from us? I don't believe so, um, unless anybody had any other questions. Um, it looks like John has joined us if he has anything he wanted to add. Hi, John, how are you? <clears throat> John, I think you're still muted. Can you hear me, John? So challenging trying to do this. <laughs> I was just gonna ask if he had any further questions for us or comments. Okay, how's that? Oh, that's much better. <laughs> Yes, I uh, had to go through two or three buttons, I guess, to unmute tonight. Uh, no, I'm uh, I'm good, and uh, I really wanted this to be Bonnie's meeting anyway, uh, uh, since she was uh, involved with it to a much greater extent than I was. I came in a little bit on the review end and uh, didn't really see much to that that needed to be added at all. Had a couple of questions for her, but uh, nothing serious that the board needs to address. Okay. Well, sounds good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your work on this. And thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome. 
All right. Did you need me, Bill? Yes, I did. Excuse me for just a second. Judy's going to see himself. She's going to go over to the sign sign on her. Yep. We've got a form. Yeah. I will. Yeah, bring that in. Bring that. And that's the board as well. That's it. Thank you. All right. Sorry for the interruption. attention simply the packet had the uh, uh, an article from the Raleigh's of cities and towns which explained how we got to where we are tonight the governor signing legislation authorizing base covering rules at the municipal level uh, there was an explanation sheet as to uh, how they get there and then there is a, a rule uh, rule requiring face coverings indoors and in public spaces uh, these are two samples one with and one without enforcement of uh, sample ordinances that can be instated if the board so chooses to do so. So they have both of those documents in front of them to discuss. All right, and do you want to, uh, well, I think everyone pretty much knows that uh, Governor Scott has left it up to the towns to decide whether or not to, to uh, do a mask mandate in the town. And, um, it's my opinion, personally, I don't, I don't feel that we should. I, I feel that um, a mask mandate or anything like that is a personal choice and it shouldn't be um, our public officials that are um, mandating such a thing. It's just not, it's not right in my mind. Um, I'm one of five, five here on the board, but I think it's, uh, it's all about personal choice. You know, if you, if you feel unsafe, anywhere you go, um, you can wear a mask, you know? I mean, I, I remember when I was a kid going on an airplane and I'd see people, and I don't mean to be discriminating, but I'd see like Asian people with a, with a mask on. And I remember saying to my parents, how can that lady's got a mask on? And they would say, well, my mom would explain, well, you know, either they've got a weakened immune system or something going on that they are afraid they're gonna get sick. And I said, oh, okay, you know, just thought that was fine if they want to do that, you know, but I don't feel like um, it, it should be everybody's personal choice and not mandated by the town or the state or the U.S. government. That, that's my opinion. Um, I don't know how you feel, Brian. I actually be interested to see how everyone feels. <laughs> Um, I'd like to I'd like to have the board speak before we hear from the rest of the audience. 
So I feel the same as Bob. Uh, if there is a mandate, I think it should have come from the government. They know more about it. They keep them close to track. If, if, if there's a threat, then I think he should have made it a mandate. For him to put it on to us, I, I just don't agree with it. I think if restaurants or businesses want to have, I think they should do it. That should be up to them. But I don't, to make people force them, I just don't agree. Period. Yeah, those um, echo my feelings as well. Uh, when there was a state of emergency, the governor did his due diligence and did what he had to do. And at this point in time, he doesn't see any reason uh, for a state statewide mandate and my personal opinion is that neither do I. I uh, to have a townwide mandate. I I carry at least two masks in my pocket all the time. Uh, when I go somewhere I mean there is in my wife and I were in Burlington over the weekend. Every place we went into we wore a mask. That's our that's our choice. It wasn't mandated. Um, and to the hospital. And, I mean, it's mandated in the hospital, so you automatically were one there anyway. Um, but, and I, f I feel that's the same way in town. If uh, businesses want to require masks when you go in, that's absolutely fine. I'll, I'll abide by their wishes and I'll still go in. But um, for an elected official, to have the right to mandate what a person can do or cannot do is absolutely not correct, in my opinion. Jess, um, can you like, hear? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. I can hear you okay. well. Um, thanks for everyone for sharing your views on this. Um, I feel differently. I work in a school um, and I wear a mask every day um, and so do all the students and it's not convenient and it's not comfortable and it's difficult to hear each other. Um, but because of the mask wearing um, in our setting, we've been able to stay in person. And I feel many different ways about mask wearing. My personal feelings, um, I can put aside because it is uncomfortable and it is inconvenient um, and it's really annoying. It's hard to hear people um, I don't believe that government should tell people what to do in normal circumstances, but we do tell people all the time what to do in order to keep the greater good safe. Um, we, we make sure that people behave at bars and we make sure that people um, hunt at certain times of year and we make sure that people obey the speed limit. I mean, it's to me, it's it's the same um, because we're looking at a question of protecting of protecting people with weakened immune systems. And to your point, Bob, um, people don't just wear masks to protect themselves, but we they wear masks to protect other people from their droplets. Well, that's um, that's your opinion. That's not that's not everybody's opinion, and that's not every medical person's opinion. <laughs> Just it's right. It's well, I, and and unfortunately, this has become extremely um, contentious, and it's become politicized. And I and I, I feel that it, that's very unfortunate. Um, but the scientists and the leaders that I've looked to over the last couple of years um, do still recommend wearing masks, and um, also on the Vermont Department of Health, um, it says. The need to wear a mask indoors is expected to be temporary while vaccination levels increase and the Delta variant surge ends. Wearing a mask helps protect you and the people around you from getting or spreading COVID-19. A mask helps contain your respiratory droplets and can keep them from reaching other people. COVID-19 can spread even if a person does not have any symptoms. This is how we reduce spread of the virus and outbreaks in our community schools and businesses. And so to me, yeah, I do, I do feel com conflicted because I don't I don't believe that um, I don't I don't really believe in top down government. I do believe in um, 
getting the opinion of the people. I wish we could have a vote on it. That, that would be the fairest way to decide. Um, but I also like what I worry about here is what happens if a business is now going to impose a mask mandate on their customers, you know, now we put the onus back to the businesses, the onus of the enforcement. And, and then I guess people can choose whether or not to, um, to visit those establishments, but I don't think that's fair either. I think it, it's easier. What I worry about is um, effects on local businesses. And as a select person, I feel that it's my job to do, do something that is the best for all of our community, our elders and our, our immunocompromised and to make sure that we're not putting an onus on businesses that now, okay, well, if they, if they say you have to wear a mask, are people going to not um, frequent their businesses? Like we need all the help we can get in our local businesses. So uh, those are my thoughts. I, I believe I'm outnumbered. I'm not sure um, where Judy sits on this issue, um, but thank you for listening to me. Yeah, I'm not sure either. And I hope she signs back on because we'll get her uh, opinions on it too. But thanks for your comments. And you certainly, you know, certainly entitled to your opinion. Everybody's got different ones. That's why we've got five different people on the board. Um, does anyone want to speak? And, and before before you do, please, when I call on you, please stand and say your name and um, where you're from and, and try to speak loudly. Go ahead, ma'am. I'm sorry. Also, Gary, um, Bob, um, can we um, just have a time limit on this too? Because I feel like this could go into ATV territory where people have a lot to say. Uh, yeah. Thank you. If I see it starting to get out of hand, I will definitely say something. Yeah, what, was, what was your time of speaking? Ms. Ms. Well, we, we have in the past given, um, what, how much? Two minutes or something like that? Two minutes, yeah. Two minutes, I think, from the speaker. And you could speak twice. So I'll, I'll do that, Jess. Go ahead, ma'am. My name is Shanara Johnson, and um, I would like to repeat some of the things that uh, Jess mentioned. Um, a lot of people say, what's the harm? It's only a minor inconvenience. If it saves even one life, it's worth it. Um, actually, there was a study on 100,000 students uh, from Brown University, Professor Emily Oster, and they found that in areas of high community transmission, masked school students saw a case rate 37% higher than non-masked school students. School staff experienced an 84% higher case rate in masked schools. In May 2021, a University of Louisville study using CDC data discovered that mask mandates and use are not associated with lower SARS-CoV-2 spread among the United States and among US states. They concluded our findings do not support the hypothesis that SARS-CoV-2 transmission rates decrease with greater public mask use. They even said that prolonged mask use pro promotes facial alkalinization and inadvertently discourages dehydration. They found that wearing a mask leads to a rise in carbon dioxide in the blood of the wearer that uh, leads to a decrease of oxygen in the blood of the wearer, uh, impaired respiratory function. <laughs> And um, in Gainesville, Florida, some um, parents submitted face masks to a lab for analysis, and they found that the masks were contaminated with bacteria, parasites, and fungi, including three with dangerous pathogens. Uh, the pathogens included pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, sepsis, encephalitis, antibiotic resistant pneumonia, bloodstream infections, UTIs, food poisoning, Lyme disease, diphtheria, Legionnaires disease, severe infections. 50% um, of the masks were contaminated with one or more strains of pneumonia causing bacteria. 33% were contaminated with one or more strains of meningitis, uh, meningitis causing bacteria. Other pathogens were those included um, causing fever, ulcers, acne, yeast infections, strep throat, periodontal disease, healthy mountain spotted fever, and more. This is what you get when you wear a mask for eight hours. This is what this looks like. This is from a dad, a Facebook dad who was a lab scientist, and he took the masks, he took the masks of his kids after eight hours of wearing, and um, uh, basically uh, put the sample 
into a petri dish and and um, this is what came out of it. Thank you. Someone else want to speak? Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'll go here. Yeah. All right. We elected the folks to take care of the town. And for a couple, minus a couple of things, you've done a really great job. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. And what I'm not going to mandate this. But we got to take care of our people in town. And you, you know, there's two passages. One, you can put the mandate with no penalty. <clears throat> and I, I think it's, it's up to the board to, to take care of the people. Put a mandate on. People don't want to wear the mask and go in. That's, that's fine. And, but, but it shows it shows people that you care about the town and what you're doing. You're, you're leading uh, by example. <clears throat> now, uh, if I wear a mask and I'm wrong, and this is what's going to happen to me. What's going to happen? It's me. Yeah. It's up to me in the mask. If you don't wear a mask and you're wrong, somebody could die. And that's how I look. So that's all I hope you do for a Does it have to have penalty? Like Tom. Thank you. Um, is it possible to read like what the penalty would be? So people could understand like, what enforcement would look like. There's there's two options on the table currently, and we don't have to pass a mandate with a penalty. But we should know what it could potentially. It could be. potentially be eight hundred dollars, but that's not what we're looking at. What does that? What is it? There's there's a a is there any jail time associated? No. So it's only a fine. So have a of up to eight hundred dollars. Point of order, please, yeah. one at a time from the floor. Comments to addressed to the chair, please. Yeah. Thank you. We don't know. We we haven't we haven't created anything. We're just this is just potential. You know? So my question is, did the governor outline what our like what could potentially no. a town choose to do? No. <clears throat> Well, uh, as far as what's your, specifically your question, because I don't want to have the wrong information. What could enforcement be? So, is it um, an arrest? Is it a ticket? Fine. Like, what are the what is the, uh, the, parameters. the parameters? Did the governor give specific parameters? The specific parameters were a civil penalty, which is a traffic ticket, basically, right? A civil, Vermont civil complaint. Uh, it's the same ticket that's issued at a traffic stop. Uh, the maximum penalty could be eight hundred dollars. So they allowed for waiver penalties for those who chose to pay it uh, without contesting the ticket. So, review and the board has the option to set the fines and the waiver penalties at whatever rate they want. Um, I don't even sure. I know Burlington has opted to do it with enforcement. I'm not even sure what their penalties were that they chose, um, but it's, it's it's similar to all other fines within uh, the traffic violation laws, but it's not an arrestable offense. And, I, and Steve, correct Steve, me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Eric. Um, we the board would have the option of passing a mandate that doesn't come with any fines or repercussions. That's that what he just said. Yeah, that's correct. You don't okay. you don't have to. You can use one that does not have. Okay. Oh. Steve, go ahead. I'm Steve Benson. I'm the Shalmat Restaurant. I wish the board had voiced their opinions to let everybody talk. Basically, the board has already made it. So I'm going to say what I wanted to say when I came here. CDC says any business can make a mask mandate if they want. You, as a town, I would like to see it done because what will happen now by you saying no and the businesses that have the sign on the door saying masks are required, we're going to have the response from the people coming through that door is. The town says, I don't need one, so I'm not going to wear one. That's what's going to happen. And also, if a business has a COVID case, that business has to close. And as a matter of fact, one of our restaurants here in town just closed for a few days because they have a COVID case. And that business is going to lose money because that person who affected has to be up 10 days. And the other people have to be get tested. Obviously, the mask isn't going to stop, stop the virus, but it's going to slow it down. I honestly believe that 
I went to mass mandate as a Thanksgiving. And have been ever since. Yes, there are people that come through that door that don't want to come in, but I do have to ask them now. If you're on around late, so I do business. That's okay. I'm taking care of my staff, making sure my staff doesn't get COVID. And I'm the only restaurant in Lumoai County that has not had a close because of a COVID case since this started. I'm proud of that. My staff's proud of that. Not one person getting sick. But mask mandate, I think the town should do. Because I know for a fact what's going to happen. People are going to say, town says they don't have to have one. I'm not talking about it. That's what the governor says, too. The governor's saying, I know, and I wish, you know, governor, I wish the governor did the past mandate. It would have been a lot easier for everybody through the whole state. It'd be easier for us, too. Yeah, I know. Everybody alone. But that's my opinion. And I, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay, you first, and you, Claudia. So, my question is, is with the mandate, is it like, do you leave the house with your mask on and until you get back home, you can't take it off? Because you go into the store online, you come into my place, how are you going to eat tacos? How am I going to eat hey, you bacon you and eggs? You, you, take, you take your mask off. Like, does COVID go away right. for that time you're eating the meal? That's my <laughs> You can't have it both ways. You can't control and then be just expect us to be ignorant. You know, you go on an airplane, that lady or the gentleman walks down the aisle and hands out a cookie and a soda. You can take your mask off, but then you're required to put it back on as soon. So where where does COVID go during that time you're eating the cookie? These, these conversations are happening all over the world. I understood. So I just, what I want to know is if, if this mandate requires me to wear it, am I going to get fined? Or if there's no penalty, am I going to get held up in my day because I don't have a mask on while I'm driving. Are we going to get pulled over for no? Yeah, I see people in an Audi on a 97 degree day with the air conditioner on by themselves wearing a mask. Yeah. And we wear, and COVID can't get you when you're doing 50 down 100 <laughs> with your windows up. So right. I don't know where this, how deep this goes, you know, but it's just a blanket mandate is, is ridiculous. Thank you. Claudia. I just wanted to say, uh, I'm Claudia Sauter. I wanted to say that I moved to this country 29 years ago, and I moved here because it's a free country. Mm -hmm. That is the reason. <laughs> That's the reason I'm still here, and that's the reason I would like to stay here. Because in Europe at this point, and I know that because my family lives in Germany, you're not allowed out on the street without an N95 mask. My mom has respiratory problems. If she wants to leave the house, she has to wear that. She's sick for three days afterwards. Because exactly of what Shanara said, there are so many bacteria and stuff on those masks. If you wear them for any amount of time, that it makes her sick. But she can't leave the house without it anymore. And uh, it doesn't end with the mask mandates. We need to be clear that it's a gateway drug, right? I mean, I look at Europe and they're discussing mandatory vaccines. Since when is somebody else deciding what goes into my body? And if somebody wants to get the vaccine, they can get it and they should be safe and they should be fine. But I had a horrible experience with vaccines <coughs> 20 years ago, it almost killed me. So I'm extremely cautious of what I put in my body. And the same is true with masks. I tried it once because I brought a friend to the hospital last year sometime when it all started. And I had to put on the mask for two days. I was stuffed up. I couldn't really breathe well. I was, I was like, what is this? Why is this even happening to my body? I'm usually perfectly fine. So I think a mandate should not come from the government. If somebody feels more safe with a mask on, they should wear it, no problem. And if somebody feels much healthier without it, then they should, that should be their choice. Thank oh, you. and I wanted to say something about businesses. I've gone to businesses when, when it all was, everybody was masking up. I went to businesses that allowed me in without it, and I went to businesses that did curbside that didn't allow it. So I've not not patronized the business because of that. Thank you. Bob, you have two people on my yeah. other hands up as well. I'd also like to. Go ahead, sir. And just to be clear, I'm, I'm a Johnson resident. My name is Bill Moore. Um, I'm a volunteer advocate for Health Choice Vermont, and I think I can fill in a couple of gaps for you. Um, I was in the special session. The legislature gave you this stuff, uh, this in your yeah, mind. The governor, I hear people say, the governor says we can do this, we can do that. That's not it. 
It was the legislature that adopted this in the lab. They're the ones that wrote the bill. The parameters are very simple. Fair enough. You, you can write a rule. You're limited by the civil civil penalties, as this gentleman uh, mentioned earlier. But there are no other parameters. And Burlington took it to the excess. And it's 50 first offense, 152nd offense, 500 every offense after that. Also, Burlington's rule was written in a way. I mean, the, the ultimate question you have to answer as a select board is how much do you want to divide a community? How, how much nasty, divided, arguing and, and confrontation and burden on law enforcement do you want to endure for what came? In Burlington, the YMCA, the Greater Burlington YMCA, where I learned to swim, the place has been there, I think, 100 years. They have denied every current member who is not vaccinated and have also denied them access to the building and denied them the option of a mask. So not only has Burlington passed a mask rule with basically light criminal penalties and fines. Um, by the way, if you don't pay the fine, it does become a misdemeanor criminal penalty. But they've converted in the way they wrote their rule to the extreme so that these institutions are taking it as a group, a collective vax mandate. To go to the Greater Burlington YMCA, you do not have the option to wear a mask. You only have the option of showing a vaccine card against your medical privacy to get in access. A current member, a friend of mine's 17 year old son, is now from the building. So, what, I, what I'm stressing to people, I sat through Hardwick's meeting the other night. Um, so I was in the special session, I sat through the growing community, it was in the Hardwick meeting. They had much the same conversation. They arrived at the conclusion simply that it was too divisive, that the enforcement was an unworkable, unreasonable waste of time and resources, and it would only divide the community further. So I would leave you with this. If anybody hasn't heard what Dave Giacomoni said when he voted against this on the House floor, and they should hear it again. He said, this, he said the squeeze isn't worth the, worth the juice. This is too divisive. It's just not worth it. And that's why we both know. And if you know Dave Giacobone, those are pretty powerful words. He used to sit on this board right here in the chair. I know he did. I know he did. So I'll leave you with this. I'm a recovered COVID person. Not only can I not get a membership at the YMCA, but even if I wear a mask, I can't go in. At Johnson State College, where I'm a 1988 alumni, I can't go to a concert this week in which that young man who's being denied access to the Green the Greater Burlington YMCA uh, is acting and go see that even if I wear a mask. Because on our state camp, college campuses, there's also an effective vaccine mandate. So let's, uh, let's just really take a breath and kind of settle down and do the right thing to each other for each other but not because of the law. Thanks for your comment. <laughs> yes, a couple, couple virtual uh, question. A comment. Betsy Rich and I think Judy's the other one. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I'm Betsy Rich. I, I live in Morrisville. I just spoke at Stowe's meeting a few moments ago. Um, I'm excited to hear so many folks saying no for the mask mandate. Uh, thank you to the members of the select board that are thinking about our freedoms and our, um, our own individual responsibilities. I just want to say, I agree with what Bill just said. It would be so divisive. It causes more tension than it's worth. It causes discrimination in our community. I worry about our businesses that are already having trouble getting employees. They'll have trouble keeping employees and have fewer customers. Please vote no. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Judy, can you give us your opinion now? Yes. Um, first of all, I, I checked with uh, Memorial County Chamber of Commerce um, and they are putting out a survey to the businesses I'd rather go on data than on just someone's basic feeling on this. I've also been in touch with the hospital. Um, I'd like us to have the data before we make some decision. And for all of those of you sitting in this meeting without masks on, you're the reason I left. I felt so uncomfortable. I have a medical issue. And being that in that 
enclosed room with all of you without your masks, I had to leave to keep myself safe. Okay, do we, any other comments? <coughs> Hold on a second. You, first, ma'am, and then you, Brett. My name is Shiloh Bordeaux, and I'm actually from Lowell, but I um, am in this area a lot. So um, I just wanted to bring up a few points that I don't think have been covered. And one of the things that I instantly came into a problem with with this mask mandate um, when it started was that I realized I was not going to be able to wear a mask. And I talked to my medical provider and we actually figured out that it would be best for me to get an exemption. And so I got an exemption and since I've got an exemption, I have been refused at so many places all across the state where I literally cannot go in. And even some places that I have patronized for many, many years and that have always you know, accommodated my family, I've spent thousands of dollars there. Uh, the implication other than just the inconvenience for me and the additional harms that this has brought to, to my health and my family's health are the fact that we have statutes. So uh, Title IX, um, Commerce and Trade, it, it's Chapter 139, Discrimination in Public Accommodations. I don't know who's familiar with this, but it's definitely something to go ahead and read because it is very, very specific that people with disabilities are to be accommodated. And so there's definite legal implications for all of these businesses that are deciding to say, we're gonna refuse you because how do you know if somebody has a medical problem? You don't, and none of these businesses are actually inquiring and saying, hey, maybe there's some people, people who can't wear masks and they're going to be inclusive. They're actually just refusing it, so there's definite legal implications there. There's also legal implications, and maybe some of you guys have thought about this and it's why you're choosing to vote no, or having, um, you know, when the uh, you know governor and legislature had their mandates, if somebody wanted to file a lawsuit for harms, then it would be directed at them. But in your case, when they say legislature says that you guys get to make these decisions now, uh, legal implications come back on you. So somebody could say, my business has been harmed from this mandate, or my health has been harmed from this mandate. And if they can prove that there's actual harms, then they actually have a case, and they could take that case to the town or any of the people working for the town in a official and personal capacity. So there's definite, you know, concerns there. I was uh, had the privilege to sit in on a hearing in uh, Burlington where my uh, mask exemption was honored, um, probably because they were well aware of the legal implications on their end if they were to deny it. And uh, you know, basically, the judge said that if there is harm, then there is a case. So anyone who has any type of harm actually has a case. And then, um, you know, just to bring, I know that we had mentioned, we're talking all this science and data. I also had the opportunity to sit in on a hearing this past February, a civil hearing, where I listened to the state's own epidemiologist get questioned about all of this science and data that most of you, if you've listened to a press conference, have had heard our governor refer to all of our science and data, which comes to find out that there actually isn't any. <clears throat> there is not any science and data. And if you don't believe me, it's reported. You can look this up. It was uh, Mike Desitel's uh, versus the, the state. And I sat in and I listened to our own state epidemiologists say, they don't track this. They're not keeping track of if, if masks are effective or not. They actually don't check when they're doing their contact tracing. Sometimes they might ask if somebody had a mask. It doesn't come into play and there's no science and data. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. My name is Ben Olson. Um, just to add to the data, you know, somebody mentioned um, keeping to the data. You can research this anywhere on the internet. The size of the COVID particle is one nanometer. The holes in these face masks are one micrometer, which is a thousand times larger than a nanometer. So in effect, with these masks, we're trying to keep mosquitoes out using chain link fence. Right. It just doesn't make sense. And there's all sorts of information that I don't need to repeat that proves that masks are not effective. It says it right on a mask box. Yeah. You read it on a mask box, read it, what it says. Freedom and liberty is safe enough. Oh. What it says in the mask box is that it's not effective for PPE, and that's so that the entire country didn't buy it all the N95s that all of the emergency and healthcare workers needed to use. Surgical masks are meant to prevent the wearer from spreading their own droplets onto other people. That's why they're effective. That's what the box says. 
That's not. Yeah. Yeah. I also don't think this is a forum. I, I really feel um, that this is very unfortunate that there's so many unmasked people in the town offices where there is a mask rule. I don't think it's appropriate that all there's these. Rule. There's, there's, no rule. Rule. there's no rule. I, I'm reading right off a mask box right here. These masks are not personal protective equipment and are not intended as replacements or substitutes for personal protective equipment. These products are not intended for medical use to prevent any disease or illness or virus. Each mask is intended for single use only, discard immediately after use. So there's your disclaimer. I read the disclaimer, Bob, and, and what that means is that it is meant to protect the people around the wearer from the droplets. And and the reason the reason that a box says that is because because they're avoiding their own lawsuits um, because they don't want someone to say I wore a mask how how come I got COVID, but there's um, there's been all kinds of randomized highly scientific trials um, done by reputable institutions like um, Stanford around the incidence of COVID um, of COVID transmission when certain populations like there's when there's a when there's a population that is given um given free masks and told how to wear them um versus um the control and what they're finding is that there's a very significant percentage of of people who are not contracting covid um when they're properly wearing masks and when they um and when they have them available for free. And the problem with this is that people are doing research on the internet, that not everyone's sources are, um, are reliable, that the public has gotten very mixed messages from the beginning from our officials, from the CDC, from, the, our, from our very own government about what is safe and what is not, because this is pretty unprecedented. But as you mentioned, Bob, in Asia, there is a culture of mask wearing. There, there have been, um, communicable diseases spread by droplets circulating the world since before our experience with COVID-19 and masks have been proven to protect people. Um, I, I think it's irresponsible for us to give so much playtime to all the people in the room who are against masks because they are taking the liberty to not wear their masks in the room to, to put other people at risk. Um, where some people may not agree with them are not comfortable being there. And I also think the, the clapping is very inappropriate. Well, you know, I, I, I kind of share this, um, this woman's thing too, is I have a medical exemption. I'm, my heart is an AFib like all the time. And I see a um, heart failure specialist and, and I can get documentation for the exemption if I want. I don't push it and I don't, I don't play that card. I just try to be courteous when I can, but like I'm up here without a mask and I'm presenting and some people say, oh, you see Bob Beeman is not wearing a mask. Well, guess what? I'm, I'm, I have an exemption too, um, because it can put me into a place where I could have a heart attack, you know, if it's restricting me. So I don't play that card. And I also think that's an exemption. That really doesn't have something to do with a mask mandate townwide. I think the bottom line is it should be about personal responsibility and personal choice, not about the town pushing whatever it is on everybody. Well, and I know that she mentioned that we're all getting our evidence from these Google and places like that, but I actually got mine from the state's own epidemiologist. So I'm not sure if that she's not considering that that's a reliable source, but our own state's epidemiologist said that we actually don't have any evidence in this state that what we're doing is effective. Right. See, there's so much but this is the that. problem there's no way to know that unless we have unless we go into an Lady alternate reality for half an hour. Yeah. unless we go in an alternate reality where we try to do this whole I mean, year over again with no restrictions oh, wow. no yeah. mandates how do you right. how do you measure that how do you make yeah. a control that's an invalid argument i'm sorry i would just like to say i have literally a video clip from dr Fauci here on 60 minutes where he says if somebody wants to wear a mask, wear it. It might prevent, and those are his exact words, it might prevent a droplet or two, but it doesn't do anything. But if, if it makes you feel better, you can wear one. His exact words, and I can play it to everybody if you want, because that's exactly his words. 
And that's Dr. Fauci, who is our new guard. I'm so pleased. Go ahead, ma'am. Hey, everyone. My name is Olga. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, speak to a couple of things. I was a paramedic in New York City for 12 years, so I was very well versed, very trained in PPE. Um, actually, specifically, when it came to masking, we were told that whatever mask you put on your face after 15 minutes, you discard it. Exactly. It's only meant to have your encounter with your patient. Um, if you're in an emergency department and you go in and you have masks because the patient is severely immunocompromised or severely contagious and you're protecting yourself, um, that encounter should not last more than 15 minutes. And that goes for a paramedic like myself who was transferring care, a nurse who's getting anything set up, or a respiratory therapist. Um, the other thing is, after that, I became an acupuncturist, so I studied integrative medicine and classical Chinese medicine, so I know a little bit of something about why and how they use masks, particularly in um, China and throughout Asia. People wear it when they're symptomatic, and it's first a signal to let people know that they're not feeling good and that they're sick, and to stay away from them and give them space. Um, so that's how masks have typically been used prior to COVID-19 is to alert people. Um, and again, it's kind of like they're getting from A to B. They're not wearing them all day, all day long, um, but that's how they've been used um, historically. Um, the concern I have as a mom and a member of the community with a mandate is because it carries the weight potentially of a, clinic, of a criminal repercussion. And if you're going to pass a mandate without any repercussions to it, then does that open the door for just people to then say, well, we have a mandate, and then we're opening a door potentially for some type of discrimination or bullying. Um, these things happened all of last year. Um, I have a friend who has three young children. She's a single mom. She has, a, um, she has epilepsy. She has PTSD from police brutality, and she wasn't able to wear a mask. And um, last year's mandate that the government put in even had, if you have a medical condition, you don't have to wear one, and you're also protected. You don't have to explain to people what your medical condition is. Well, even with all of that, she was discriminated against. So she was limited in where she can go um, you know, for shopping to get food for her kids. And the problem is, is this is very divisive. And we can go back and forth because there's a lot of data. I mean, we have entire countries that don't have any mandates that are doing much better. We have states that don't have any mandates that are doing better. We are, it's interesting in Vermont, we're one of the most highly vaccinated states. Um, a lot of our schools aren't able with children masked, with teachers masked, they're still not able to contain, you know, there's COVID happening and kids have to not be in school for periods of time. Um, and I think that one of the other things is because this mandate could potentially just be like blanketed and people interpret it in their own way. You know, we have very um, vulnerable people in our community. So I have a son who's autistic. He also is an asthmatic. He cannot really wear anything over his face for an extended period of time. Um, he really can't barely tolerate it. But on the face, you don't know who has what. And so to put something like this is just creating more barriers. Um, if people want to wear a mask, by all means do that. There are certain situations where I do that absolutely. And if I'm encountering someone um, who prefers that I wear a mask, I don't have any problem doing that. If you know, we have that respectful conversation one to one. If businesses want to require a mandate for their business, that's absolutely your right to do. Um, and in doing that, as a business owner, yes, you are required to then enforce that. Like any any requirement that a business has. If you don't want people coming in shirtless, then you're required as that business to say, hey, we need people with a shirt on. It's that simple of a discussion. Mandates are dangerous because now what we do is we put the onus, so we put the responsibility of enforcing that on law enforcement um, because that is what can be done and that's what's being done in other towns. And you know, for a community that really holds social justice as a priority, I find it really troubling that that's never mentioned in these types of discussions because this is a social justice issue. Because when you have mandates and laws, we understand that there's a history with law enforcement that people of color and marginalized groups tend to be the ones that are the most targeted. So we need to understand this in a really bigger picture than just, it makes me feel better when other people have it. Um, we can have those conversations one-to-one -one in our community settings, but we have to really think, you know, we can't have government solve all of our problems or make us feel better because we don't like that some people aren't complying and other people are in the way that we think. 
I also recovered from COVID, and there's a lot of places that I won't be able to go to because now they're requiring vaccinations. Um, this is a serious problem when we have this type of a situation where people are being forced with certain healthcare decisions and certain medical appliances on their face and on their body. We're going down a road that we're never going to be able to come back from. So that's just all I want to say. Talk. My name is Leland Roberts. I'm, I live in Walcott, and, and I have enjoyed uh, coming to Morrisville to shop um, throughout this last year because of the fact that there were many places that, that did not require the mask. And I, I, uh, I don't have a, a literal allergy to that, but to a mask, but I have a, a, a spiritual and a, and a, a, a intellectual um, um, problem with it. But it, it doesn't just, it doesn't just stop there. Um, you know, before OSHA was named to be the vaccine um, enforcer, they used to be about the business of protecting the people in businesses who were required to wear masks and acknowledging really that, that it is not a simple uh, and, and inconsequential requirement to, to, to wear these, to wear these. And, and, um, there, and OSHA has a whole set of requirements on the businesses that require the uh, mask wearing, and 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 now we are just about to and and um, whatever the, whatever the board here decides, I, I certainly hope the, the, the vote is against one, but that we're about to um, make this requirement with 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 without any sense of the the potential danger for it. There was N95, the 3M mask. I was going to put it on, doing some sanding at home. Said caution, can be can cause. A harm or death if used improperly, and and I, I do I do appreciate the the, the speakers uh, note that they are likely trying to limit their own liability around this, but there there um, any um, business that requires a uh, uh, employees to wear masks, they have to go through a lot of steps before it comes to that to to try to mitigate any to try to mitigate the harm basically, and then once it's understood that that is essential. Uh, gear, then there are rules about how they're worn. They have to be properly fitted, there has to be observation, and and yet we believe that um, we can just say, okay, here, everybody everybody wear a mask. It's a, it's a big experiment. We're turning epidemiology, it seems, upside down. It used to be, if you're sick, you stay home. Uh, the, 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 the elderly, the infirmed, we protect them, and yet we don't mask the healthy. The healthy actually uh, help us process uh, uh, viruses, and 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 so there, there's a whole lot to talk about. But I I, I want to I, I the, importantly where the rubber hits the road is that you know I, I can't um, I'm kind of afraid to tell you how many thousands of dollars I spent. I just bought a place in Wolfpack, and I can review on everything. And I come to I come to Morrisville for for the shopping, and and I am the kind of guy that on a matter of principle will go elsewhere. And so um, there is a uh, there is a uh, there is an economic component to this. I, I think that may be need some consideration. But I appreciate the opportunity to have uh, I have have my words here. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a resident, but I but I I'm, I'm a lover of all this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to, we're going to take just a couple more, and then we're going to do a motion. Yes. Go ahead, sir. I'm Chuck Riffenberg. Uh, I am a Morrisville resident. I have a business right across the street in Morrisville. Um, I could go, we could go all night about the science and the evidence. I think just to quickly touch on that, uh, what's not getting said is the number of scientists and doctors, PhDs, people with more credentials than anybody in this room that have been censored off of the internet, not allowed to participate in the debate. That have been, you can only have one opinion on this issue or you are cast aside. You are demonetized, you are not allowed to have your opinion on this issue unless it is what they want you to say. Um, so I'll, we'll leave all the science to the scientists, um, and I'll just leave it personal on my end. Like, I like this town. Uh, I lived in Waterbury before this, and I'd much rather be here. Uh, I just got married. I'd like to raise my kids here. Um, you know, don't make me leave. I'm not, I will leave. So I'd like to stay here and be prosperous and run a business with all you folks. Uh, thank you. Just a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. One more. Just short ones. Just just to reinforce that nothing you do here tonight can stop people from voluntarily wearing masks 
anywhere they'd like. That's them. correct. For their own comfort and protection of any type. They could wear a full on respirator if it's like this. They can walk around in <laughs> astronauts here. I wish we felt more comfortable. I really, that's not what we're trying to protect. We are, we're fighting for choice, not anti anything. And so yeah. I appreciate her dilemma. And I know she can't see me, but I wish she felt more comfortable coming here. I'm not her immune system. No, nobody in this room is her immune system. She has her own immune system. She needs to work that. All right. Okay. Go ahead, man. I know you were trying to work. Hi. My name is Emily Rooney Bryan. And um, I mostly just want to say like, throughout this entire thing, me, for me personally, the biggest issue has been making other people feel uncomfortable. Like, that is not something that. I want to do. I like people. I want people to feel like they can be comfortable around me. I'm, I'm sad that that's what's happened today, in a, you know, in a way. Um, but I've also spent the last few years kind of shying away from that because I don't want, like, I, you know, I'm, I can bend to other people's, you know, comfort level. But at some point, I also have to be true to what resonates with me, and you know, to to put that aside all the time in order to allow other people to feel safe. Um, I don't feel safe. I feel like people see me unmasked and I'm they see me as a threat. You know, and I think that's why so many of us are here in numbers without masks on tonight. Because unfortunately we are on the defense. We are being attacked. We are being pigeonholed. We're being told we're bad, that we're aggressive to society. We're like not allowed to be in society anymore in many ways. We're being excluded. So I understand that it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable on both sides. And I'm sorry for people's discomfort, but if that's something that's happening and we need to see, have a little bit of a bigger picture where we're going on this whole thing. And I'm, I, I wish this weren't the case. Like I wish this whole thing would go away. And we could just be neighbors without fear. And, Us um, too. So I, I'm going to try myself. I will be respectful to anybody's wishes. I will still go into businesses that have asked me to ask. Like I'm, I want to support my community, but I also want to feel like I'm allowed to be who I am in my community. Thank you. Thank you. So I do want to proceed. Do you want to? Propose a motion. Are you? Are you? Do you want to do a motion, Jess or Judy? Um, sure. For whatever it's worth. Um, um. Well, I guess I don't know if it's I don't know if it's worth worth it because I know that um, I know that we have at least three who don't want to do a mass mandate. Well, it's um, still good to go through the process. Okay. Um, so I propose that um, the town of Morristown um, adopts a rule requiring um, face covering indoors in public spaces um, with no um, with no um, with no penalty for those who don't um, who don't abide. Um, so that would be um, we got two possible um, <clears throat> We got two possible mandates from the um, Vermont League of Leagues of Cities and Towns, um, so that would be um, the one that doesn't um, include a fine. Okay, second. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Judy, second. Second. As a second by your duty. All right. Is there any further discussion on this? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Want to do a roll call? Aye. Yeah, roll call. Um, Jess, your eye. Aye. Judy, your eye. Correct. Gary? No. Brian? No. I'm no as well. Motion failed, three to two. But I respect your, uh, your decision. I would like to say, too, that I do care about my community. I'm not voting no, but I've, we have rights. And I, I, I don't like this either. <laughs> No, I also want to say that, as I said earlier, that I will certainly respect any businesses that want to require a mask. That's absolutely fine to me. I'll wear it. Um, if they don't, I probably won't. Or 
Maybe I will. I mean, if I go into the grocery store, it doesn't require a mask. I may wear one anyway. I, I typically do. And so I probably will continue doing that. But uh, again, I don't begrudge anybody their wishes and their thoughts. And it's a good thing we all don't think the same way. <laughs> I, I just want to reiterate, say one more time, I just feel like this shouldn't be decided by our public officials, meaning us in this case. It's all about uh, personal responsibility and personal choice. That's all I got to say. Uh, all right, we'll move on to the next item. I'd also like to say that over 750,000 people have died of COVID since March 2020. I don't know anyone who's got it. We still love the Charmosky. By the way, for this young lady, if you came to us and you told us she had a valid condition, I don't make any people mad. Oh, you don't know. Because I don't love this. No, because we've been doing that from day one. So if you want to take a minute, five minute recess and let folks filter out that aren't going to take the rest of the minute. We call recess for a couple minutes. Just take a look at what I said before. Thank you. Folks, if I have your attention, we're in a five minute recess. If you plan to leave before the next article, please, if you would, uh, we've got a lot of business yet to attend to. Thank you. We do. We have a long agenda. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh. 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 Oh.
if you're conducting business, we're muted. We can't hear anything. Thank you. We can hear now. Thank you. Okay, so we'll discuss the road extension of Gordon Lane. So Gordon Lane is a road that's already been named. It comes off of Jersey Heights and it accesses a uh, current nine unit apartment building. The uh, proposed 136 unit buildings, uh, the road access comes in from uh, by Mike Alexander's right. entrance only. The state has approved the naming of the entire roadway, Gordon Lane, mm -hmm. start to finish. So your approval tonight would allow for the, the entire length of that road to be Gordon Lane. <clears throat> do I hear a motion? So moved. Motion by Brian, do I have a second? Second. Second by Gary. Is there any further discussion on this? It's curious about the safety of that road emptying out onto 100 just above Mike Alexander's. Uh, that one not, doesn't empty out. It's not so. emptying out there. It's going to be a one way entrance anyway requested by the fire department. The only right. exit Thank is going to be where, uh, where Gordon Lane is currently. Thank you. You're okay. back. All in favor say aye. 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 Judy. Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed. I'll do roll call. No. All right, number four, appoint Donnie Blake as an alternate to the DRB. Donnie has been uh, already been appointed by the DRB as an alternate. This is just a formal recognition from the select board as you are the one to appoint all board members. Okay. So I make a motion we appoint him. All right. I have a motion by Brian. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Second by Gary. Any further discussion? Um, yeah, I I do. I had a few people emailing me about um, the process um, that board vacancies become public and um, who actually is on the list and um, how those vacancies are publicized. Um, and it doesn't seem like a transparent process to me. Um, and in the name of transparency, um, I, I feel that we should um, make each vacancy um, public and allow for a period where people can apply. Um, especially, especially right now with, um, with all the development going on, I feel like I feel like if um, if this were a a publicized vacancy, that we would have a lot of people addressing the. Do you know about that, Gary? I, I can't understand what you said, Jess. But if you're talking about advertising for the position that's been advertised, um, and Donnie Blake, and there was one other um, applicant. And when he found out that Donnie Blake was uh, applying for the position, he uh, he stepped back because he said that uh, he told Todd that Donnie had much more experience and uh, had been around the town a lot longer and thought he would make a better uh, better applicant than, than he. And I I am sorry, but I don't remember the person's name. That he's a, a local person here in Marshville. <laughs> But I, I don't remember the name. Todd Thomas would remember it, but it was advertised. And um, this is the second or third time that we've advertised for alternate positions. Yeah. And previously we got one one applicant, and this time we were fortunate enough to get to get two. And like I say, Donnie, uh, the other gentleman stepped aside and deferred to Donnie on this. Yeah, I, I don't know what you're hearing, Jess, but in the past. Yeah. 
we advertise these positions every time we have a vacancy. And where are they, like, where are they it says, We get where one person. Advertised? Where are they advertised? Front porch forum. Front porch forum, Front the website. Forum. It's in uh, News and Citizen. I News and Citizen before. I've seen it in News and Citizen before. Yeah. Every time we have a vacancy for any of those boards, you know. I so, haven't seen anything on Front Porch Forum. I haven't either. Maybe so not yeah. I have to agree with Jess. I, I find the process to be not as transparent as I'd like it to see. I, I think Donnie is an excellent choice. He's, you know, a lot of experience. He's very qualified, but uh, um, I'd like us somehow to look at a different process so that we can um, get some new faces and new blood on our boards. We're all for that too. We just got to have the applicants. I'm be more glad to. Uh, have you set in on the next interview process when we do one? Um, right. Um, I don't know how much I don't know how much more transparent that than the board can be. But uh, well, I think I mean I think for um, for people who've been in town government for a long time, it it does seem very transparent because you all know the process. But I don't think the average person in Morrisville um, finds the process very transparent and. Like Judy's saying, like I haven't seen anything on Front Porch Forum. I haven't seen anything in the paper. I don't know what the um, I don't know what the timeline is. Like when the vacancy becomes available, um, how long the the um, how long you give for app applicants to apply, and then um, and then and what the qualifications are, and then um, and then how um, <clears throat> how long it is until the person um, gets appointed. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to check with Todd on um, the timelines and uh, but uh, this has been probably a couple of months ago now uh, since we interviewed Donnie. So, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't have had you wouldn't have seen any applicant or any uh, requests for applicants in the last at least couple months anyway. It was previous to that. I know it's been in the and paper. I, I've read I, it before in the paper. From my limited experience with Donnie, um, just sitting in with um, with him on one um, board of civil authority meeting, I he seems really intelligent and on point. Um, he certainly knew much better than I did what was going on that night and had all the paperwork in line and um, has obviously been a successful business owner. Um, and contractor in the town. I just, um, like I said, I, I, um, I, I can't support um, appointing someone when I, I'm not clear on the process. Okay. Well, we can certainly iron it out. So it's written down. So it's a policy on how we appoint individuals and where we advertise it and the whole outline. So you know exactly what it is. I mean, I've been I've been doing it 13 years, and that's the way it always happens. It gets advertised in the paper to people that it sometimes it takes a while to even get one person to right. uh, be an applicant, you know. And, and I don't. I've had people ask me, and 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 before I've, I've had them say, "Oh, what's it take to be a DRB member or you know BCA member?" They they want to know, and then I tell them, and they're like, "Oh, well, maybe I don't want to do that." Right. You know, that's a that's the kind of thing that happens usually. And how much time it takes and the meetings and everything but i know that we we do our due diligence to advertise these spots you know and i think there's a lack of um people looking you know and not seeing them they, they may hear that oh we're we're uh, gonna appoint donnie blake but like gary said that was a couple of months ago it was probably advertised so you won't, wouldn't even see it so i want to say that i'm all for looking into this making sure we get it documented how we do it and if there's any way to improve it because i'm all for being uh, letting the public know what we're doing how we're doing it the thing is too i agree over the years the number of people that don't apply right. it's not our fault if they can't if they don't know about it or don't i don't know how you go door to door to, to tell them so i do want to make sure that we know how it's being done making sure it is being done right and if there's any way to improve it and in fact i don't even know if we have to do this tonight because it's an alternative right 
It's an alternate. What? I'm going to point out that Todd Thomas is on the screen, and yeah. he's your planning director and also sits uh, in advisory mm -hmm. capacity on other boards, and he might have some shed some light on this. Right. Todd, do you have any comments about it? You're muted. Hi, sorry about that. Thanks. So this there is a go. DRB alternate. This is a DRB alternate seat. The uh, position was first uh, talked about a couple months ago. In fact, Donnie Blake's been appointed by the village trustees for about two months now. The select board has had a busy agenda and it's been till now until we could get him on the agenda. Uh, if you want to wait one more meeting, uh, feel free, but I need him for my January meeting. And the reason I need an alternate is the two alternates I currently had until uh, two months ago were both former Graham Mink tenants. So when Graham had a project in, you have the, uh, Paul Trudell is the architect, Graham's in-house architect for all his development. And Paul's the second longest DRB member. So Paul recuses himself from all DRB hearings and the both alternates I have to fill Paul's seat are also compromised because they're Graham's tenants. So. This is a matter of important business. I need someone to fill the seat when Graham has applications in because Paul draws Graham's plans, if that makes sense. Well, we have a motion on the floor. So are we, are we gonna, I'm about ready to say, all in favor say aye. Uh, Todd, would you just refresh my memory on how these positions are advertised for and for how long? Yeah, I think um, the last time we advertised on this, we got a few interested candidates, uh, Christy Snip was the last alternate appointed. Uh, it was on Front Porch Forum. It was on the website. It was on the forum a couple of times, I believe. And we got four people, uh, only one of which, Christy Snip was the only person who showed up to the DRB interview. So the way the process works, uh, the, uh, the call is put out that we're looking for an alternate for in this case. Uh, people are invited to come to the DRB. They meet with the DRB. The DRB interviews the candidates. And at the end of the meeting, the DRB talks among itself and pass a recommendation for appointment along to the select board and the village trustees. DRB and planning is jointly appointed. So in this case, uh, the DRB uh, most recently met with Donnie. Uh, they thought Donnie was wonderfully qualified and they asked the select board and trustees to make the formal appointments. The trustees did that about two months ago. The select board just getting around to it. Thanks, Todd. So there's a motion on the floor to appoint Donnie Blake as an alternate to the DRB. Is there any further discussion on it? I'm sorry, I just, my other question, um, and I don't mean this in any offensive way, but um, I mean, since Donnie Blake is a contractor, is that a conflict of interest for him to be on the DRB? I mean, is he sitting in on um, potential projects that he would get hired to um, to work, work at or bid? He would recuse no. himself. Yeah, I would hope you would think that we're uh, uh, better than that, Jess. Uh, I do, I else, do. I just like I. Everybody on I, the board I, has had to recuse himself from time to time, and in a small town like this, it's pretty hard to get enough volunteers to do any of these positions right. without being compromised at some time or other. And that's why we need at least two alternates, is because of the conflict of interest of Paul Trudell being an architect. I used to have to recuse myself when I worked for Manosh on several different occasions. Um, and we even, uh, Karen Sturdivant was another alternate. She was a, a tenant of Graham Manx. So she would, she would recuse herself when it came time to uh, act on a Graham Mink project. And there's been several others over the years. I've been on there for over 40 years, and I have yet to see anybody not abide by the regulations and their own personal feelings that they, you know, that they can uh, form an unbiased opinion. So, uh, now I, I think you're you're reaching out there for a problem that doesn't exist. Okay. Um, I'm just doing, I'm just asking questions and I'm also responding to a lot of, um, people who email me, um, with concerns around this kind of thing. So thanks for clarifying it. Yeah, no, I understand your, I understand your concern and like, a, and that's why I asked Todd to refresh my memory on 
uh, how this takes place. And it certainly said, I mean, it's on the town website, it's on front porch forum, and it's advertised in the Citizen. So um, I'm and not I, sure what else we can do. Yeah, I get contacted just like that too, Jess, all the time with people, you know, asking questions like that. Oh, isn't that a conflict of interest? And I say, well, like a good example is um, Paul Trudell. He's recused himself several times because he might be designing a building that's going to be decided on a DRB. That happens all the time, just like what Gary said. But the best you can do is just set them straight, make them realize that uh, our board is very good at managing it. Like Gary said, in like over 40 years. And um, it's not, not a bad thing to ask questions, but it's good to set people straight because I do the same thing. I just did that last week with another one. Asked me about, about Paul. Hey, Jess. Mm -hmm. And over, uh, I've been staffing the DRB from well north of a decade at this point, and I don't believe Donnie Blake's ever appeared in front of the DRB, so I don't have any concerns there as a staff person. Okay. All right, so I have the motion on the floor in second. Point Donnie Blake as an alternate to the DRB. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. By roll call, Jess? Nay. Judy? Judy, are you there? Can you hear me, Judy? These virtual meetings are so difficult. Gary. Aye. Brian. Aye. And I'm I as well. Judy, are you there? Motion is, there you are, Judy. You say aye, your thumbs up, okay, aye. <laughs> Motion is passed, four to one. All right, next, this is a painful meeting, I'm telling you. Number five, discuss supporting an article for half cent appropriation for the MCC, future land purposes. Ron and Brent, you're on. Uh, the you have. Yes. Well, last year you, you were wanted to do it, but you didn't have enough time to get the vote and stuff, and we we couldn't. The deadline ran out, so we couldn't do it. So we're hopefully in time. Right. And we do have projects in mind, and, uh, and that's part of my job is looking at properties that uh, should be preserved or right. some way or another. Yes. Okay. So, how's the board want to deal with this? If I can just advise you, uh, if if the board votes in, in favor of this that the wording for the article will have to be crafted specifically because being that it's an article voted on by the voters mm -hmm. only whatever the verbiage describes as the money is to be used for that's all it can be used for so right. if you use the word for projects then it can be used just for projects not for land purchases so the the draft if the board votes in support of the half cent the article has to be specific as to what the money is going to be used for so the voters are approving right. that. Well, it can say future land purposes, but it can't, it, it can't say just this project or that project, and that's going to be, you guys realize that. Well, and one example may be the next article, which won't be covered tonight, is money for a possible uh, parking lot at the Bryan on the road. Right. Uh, this is not going to discuss, but that's another right. possibility of use of uh, money uh, yes. for conservation purposes mm -hmm. and recreational purposes. 
Okay, how do we want to proceed? Do we want to make a motion? Do you want to? Uh, is this, is this for one year? How, how many years are they looking to do that for? Is, is that for one year? Motion? Yeah, one year. Yeah. We understand this is a yearly thing, and that if, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest in this town at this present time, and in the country actually, in the conservation of, of the natural resources we have left. Mm -hmm. And our, our job is to see what Morristown needs to look at and try to save and so forth. So what we're really looking at is doing this on an annual basis. We'd probably do that for three years, trying to get $100,000 saved so that when something comes up, we can act. Mm -hmm. There was a possibility of doing something and they still be in the works, but we had no funds and no right. emphasis behind it. What we're trying to do is build the interest, which I can see growing in Morristown all the time. Uh, but you, you can't be in the business and not have any funds to be able to act instantaneously. If you have a per piece of property you want to buy, you can't wait to, for a whole year to go buy it for six months. Right. So what we're trying to do is be able to be proactive, have a little reserve there, hundred thousand dollars, nothing compared to where land is going now, but to give us something that we could act to hold until the town decides whether they want to do it or not. Right. Well, my thoughts is, uh... You already have a fund, right? That's sitting there, that's been there for a long time, right? We have a fund called the Morsel Conservation right. Fund. Right. So, do you know how much it is? Sitting. Tina does. Uh, currently, the Conservation Commission has a total of thirty-one thousand four hundred dollars with their CD and their money market fund. There is also another fund that's not necessarily conservation, but it was from the forest land. You folks voted all the lobbying and stuff on the, right. and we put all that money into another account called Forest Land, which has another 21,000 that you could opt to use to help out conservation if you wanted to. Yeah. So you have about $52,000. So my thoughts are, cause you talked about, even if this passed at town meeting, we're, I don't think anybody's gonna give you the permission to all of a sudden take a hundred thousand, go do whatever you wanna do with it. My opinion, I wouldn't want to decide to spend a hundred thousand without going back to the people. So my opinion is if we had some money to to maybe start the process to hold it, is that what you're looking for? And then go to the voters and say, listen, we got a chance to do this, because the voters might not want to. So I would want to go with that kind of money, I think I'd want to go in front of the voters. I'm just saying, if I'm still here, that's the way I would go. I'm not against doing it, but I don't think it's going to go in there knowing that you can sit at the commission meeting and say, we're headed to buy this. <laughs> no, I, I, okay. I, I, think I, I think I understand what you're saying. Okay. I think, I think that's the way it works. I agree with you. Um, okay. I don't think the Conservation Commission wants the authority to go and spend $100,000. No. You guys know better than I do, but everything is usually what the town wants. And if it's a big issue, the town decides. And that's the way it should be. Yes. Right. Yeah. But I don't have a problem supporting you guys having an article. You know, I'm all in favor for that. Yeah. Too. Well, now we got fifty two thousand dollars. You wouldn't still like to do the, <coughs> the try for it. And what's the what's the half a cent? It's about thirty cent thirty cents. No, it's it's between thirty five and forty thousand dollars depending on what the grand list is. But I think last time it was thirty six thousand, I think. Yep. So again, I have no problem going and see what the people say, but that's okay. Do yeah. you want a do you want a motion to this? Well, this is sorry. Can I? Um, oh, yeah, sorry. So the question is whether this will be an article on, at town meeting. Is that yeah. yes? And do we have and we do we have the wording? No, the article is not written. This is simply a, a mostly a polling of the board. Yeah. Not necessarily needing an article, similar to what you did for Matt Lindemer, uh, indicating whether or not he needed to go and get signatures for an article for town meeting. It's a very similar circumstance. They're just looking to pull a board for the support for the article. Uh, if the board chooses to do that, I, I just simply am looking for, you know, the the verbal from you folks. If you're looking to support that, then we'll 
I'll work with Sarah and we'll draft up the article for the town meeting. I don't. You don't need a motion. I, I don't feel that way only because it's you're not taking an, an action to spend any money. You're right. simply. I would, I would think that if there's any action to be taken, we would wait until after the budget hearing. Budget after the uh, is drawn up. So we see the actual verbiage. See the see the article itself. And approve the article yeah. to go into the town report. Or, well, I don't I think, know what the proper. I'm just thinking. I'm fine with you. You know, having the article. Yeah, what's the article? But like what you said, yeah. If you, I think we don't see. The we don't need a motion right now. No, we'll need we a motion need, when we decide what the article right. is. We need and to approve. see the article before we can make a motion. We just need. What do you think, Jess and Judy? Um, I'm in support of seeing an article, and I'm I'm probably also in support of the article as well. Okay. How about you, Judy? Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So does that sound good? Mask on, we can hear you then. <laughs> so you'll work with Sarah. I will. Okay. I'll have an article for you when we get to the appropriate point in our process <laughs> to to approve the articles for the town report. Yeah. That, that article will be there. I just simply was looking for the the boards kind of the go ahead to do that. Or would the if the MCC felt strongly enough about it, would they go out and seek to get enough signatures in order to, to bypass the board and, and do it that way? I think they they deserve to just get it on as an article. You know what you're saying, it, it rings true with me. I think actually I think of Jess when think about the buildings that are empty around here. You know, like um, the service station up at the corners there. The town <clears throat> we can't just do something with that you know any big thing that would happen to that space has to be approved by the voters you know and we don't have a fund like to to start off and save and maybe you know put some money down on something start a project whether it's turning into a, a chamber of commerce or something like that you right. know we have to go to the voters and it's kind of frustrating for me i don't i don't know if jess was trying to you know she's addressing that too as far as the empty buildings, you know, in town, and it's the same kind of thing what you guys are talking about, you know, um, trying to conserve land, and and this is what I'm saying, trying to trying to conserve or re refurbish some of the properties around town, whether it's the the nephew building or or the one up there, or any of them that could use help. And I feel like sometimes we're our hands are tied; we can't do anything about it, you know. And that's one way it can happen is through through an article like that. To can establish a fund. I didn't know there was that much money. I thought there was 30, but I forgot about that logging money. And um, that, that gives you something to, to start, but that's still, like you said, Brian, it's dropping a bucket for what you, you might need. And if you can save up a few years, if, if the taxpayers will go for it, I think it's a great thing. So that's, that's what I say about it. Thank you for, thank you for what Before you guys are doing there. Is Sarah still on there? Cause uh, I know that, Last year they got they did waive the signature things, and maybe they have again this year. Sarah, are you, are you there? I am here. Um, no, we're not in a state of emergency anymore. Um, we can't be um, collecting electronic signatures. Okay, so I'm in. The if that's state what of the question. <laughs> I'm in the state of emergency myself, so I don't have to get mine right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. That do you still need anybody running for office? You still need to get the thirty um, signatures on a on a petition. Also, speaking of that, will you please remind me next time I see you? Are you me talking too. to me, Gary? I am. <laughs> get mine ready too. <laughs> okay. All right. So, are you guys happy with that? Does that sound good? We'll get it figured out. Um, also, does does that have any um, does this have any bearing on the question that you all had brought up uh, around the town plan of um, there was something about um, saying that we that Morristown has a separate conservation fund um, and that would allow um, the matching of grant funds. Um, do you all know what I'm talking about? No. 
No, um, I'm actually asking Ron, and I can't see who else is there from the MCC. Ron um, and Brett, Jess. Okay, so um, does um, during the town plan meeting uh, a few weeks ago, um, you had also um, brought up a request to um, have a separate Morrison Conservation Fund set up. Um, would this, and I, I'm, can you confirm that you know that what I'm talking about? There is a conservation, there is a Morristown Conservation Fund that the select board appointed. If you look on the bylaws for the Conservation Commission, it, it, it explains that fund outright. And, and I don't see you can tell that, but I don't think we're using that as it was detected in 92, I think. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the intent was. Uh, I just know that a certain sum was given to uh, establish a conservation commission fund that could only be used for land conservation or land conservation activities, and that's all it's being used for. And that is the $31,000 amount that I quoted you earlier. So we have had a conservation fund for a long time. I think Jess's question is in line, Bob, with the 10-year town plan language. And I, I remember reading something about it. I'm just not familiar enough to quote here. Right, I'm not But it may be something that uh, uh, Todd has signed off for the night, but he may be able to answer that question that if you create this, or, or will that fund that the, the half cent would go into, would that be uh, what the 10 year town plan is discussing? Right. Is, that, is that fair, right. Jeff? Yeah, because um, I'm thinking also, of, you know, um, Say the voters do choose to um, to accept the half cent on the dollar for this fund, and say it goes on for a few years. And I think Eric, you said that would um, amount to about hundred thousand dollars up over three years. Correct. And I was just thinking, well, that's you know that's something, but um, I mean that's a substantial amount of money. But um, wasn't there? I believe there was also a piece about the MCC wanting to write grants and needing a specific type of fund named um, and a specific, um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember, it was like a, a specific separate type of fund um, named that we were talking about in the town plan so that it, when they were writing grants, they could get more um, I don't know if it was just that um, it has to say in our town plan that we support or that we do have a fund I'm, I'm not sure why it's different than what we have already, but I just want to make sure that, I don't know if this is related. I'll ask, I'll ask Todd to clarify that, Jeff, and, and send you an email response, is that okay? Right, yeah, because I'm just thinking, I'm always thinking, well, it's great to ask <coughs> for the money, but if we can also get a matching dollar amount, that would be even better. Jeff, was that, um... I remember what you're talking about, and it seems to me like Bob referenced the Marshall Development Fund. Yes, that's what I, um, I wonder if she was talking about. To that. maybe supplement that. Is that, does that it was ring a bell? That, um, well, it was something that um, a new member of the MCC brought up. Jen, is her name Jennifer, Ron? There is a Jennifer, yeah. Yeah, I believe she, I believe it was a request that she brought up. Um, in in terms of making sure that the way the fund was set up we would be um and the way that it was um i don't know the, i don't know how to um say it um the way that it was supported in our town plan meant that it we would be able to um when she wrote grants um they would have the ability to, to match funds. I don't know. I'm speaking in circles and I, I don't yeah. have we'll have to look into it. Okay. I'll talk to Todd tomorrow. We'll look into it. Yeah. Thanks, Jess. All right. Next. Approve and sign errors and omissions. Oh, uh, we got to discuss ballot options for town meeting number seven, Bob. Oh. Oh yeah, sorry. Yep. All right. Is that you, Sarah? <laughs> It is me. So the Secretary of State's office sent an email last week that um, I have to put in an order for absentee ballots by December 15th uh, for town meeting. 
So that's why I'm bringing it up. Um, and the law changed on July 1st that you all know because of the special meeting and the select board can now um, vote if they wanna mail all uh, active voters their ballots or not for local elections. I don't have enough supplies to mail everybody ballots with my current stock. And so therefore, if the board has any indication or any feeling that they might want to um, mail everybody their ballots, I should order enough. If they don't, I'm thinking that I should not to save the money because we have the additional expense of the special meeting. I have asked uh, Stowe and Elmore because the law also states that all three select boards individually would have to approve if they were going to allow the school to mail everybody their ballots. Um, and what Elmore has told me is that they don't have an Australian ballot for annual meetings. So therefore they're for the town, it's a moot point um, and they haven't discussed it. And Stowe, uh, Lisa from Stowe has told me that she believes that they will not be mailing all of their voters um, ballots. So I just wanted to bring it up and kind of get a feeling before I spend the money getting envelopes or not. What do you think, Brian? I don't think we need to. How about you, Gary? I think we should mail absentee ballots that are requested and that's it. Yeah. Um, how about you, Jess? Jess, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, I, I mean, I guess it's hard to see into the future. Like I'm hoping that everyone feels comfortable going to the the polls, but um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think since it's town meeting and everyone expects to vote around town meeting, um, that uh, if we just mail ballots to those that request, I think we're, I think we're in good shape. I think the reason we chose to do it differently um, <clears throat> for this election coming up tomorrow is because it was such, such a strange time. So I, I, I think, I think we're okay not, not ordering more. Okay. Yeah, Judy's not on there anymore, is she? Judy just said no ballot yep. sent unless asked for. Okay. And that's that's how I feel too. I think we do what Gary said. Don't if anyone requests a ballot, we send it to them, but not to anybody else. I'm gonna suggest you make a motion to reflect that since that's what we did for the special okay. election. I'll, I'll make a motion that we uh, send out only ballots. That are requested by registered voters of Town of Morristown. Second. I have a motion by Gary and a second by Brian. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Jess? Aye. Judy? That's Jeff, a aye. thumbs up, aye. Gary? Aye. Brian? Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thanks. <clears throat> But the motion said Morristown. I believe it should be Morristown. Morristown. Morristown is what I said. Morristown. I said Morristown. No. I'm sorry. I think I said, I'm pretty sure I said Morristown. But yeah. it is Morristown. If I didn't, I meant to wrong. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sarah. Are you done with us, Sarah? I, I am. Okay. <laughs> All right, next, approve and sign errors and omissions. So I talked to Terry today because errors and omissions are not my strong suit. What she described is she has two different uh, requirements for signatures here, two different certificates. The first one is for uh, late homestead filers. So if someone um, asked for an extension on their income tax in the April time frame, so they, they didn't do their taxes until later in the summer and opted to wait until they did file in order to file for their homestead. That's reflected here. Thank you. Uh, those are reflected here. The tax rate goes down, but the assessed value of the property stays the same. 
with what she explained to me. Okay. And that's the, that's the first one. That's the uh, those are the, the filers for Homestead. Yeah. And you see them there. Sixty page fifty seven. And then the second errors and emissions, uh, you can see those are for current use changes. And each line has an explanation as to which, you know, how much the difference in the dollar value was. Right. So this is the work that Terry does for us. She, she cleans up our, uh, our books, our grand list books. And assesses the the values and makes sure apples are apples, and she does a fantastic job. She's highly sought after. I can tell you, just throwing a couple of words her way right now. Uh, it's amazing, amazing work she does, and she she helps us out a great deal doing so. Okay. Uh, do I hear a motion regarding this? Should we do them separate? Please, two separate motions. So I'll make a motion that we do the first one. Which is the late filers. Late filers. Yeah. Motion. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Second by Gary. Any further discussion? Uh, yeah, there's nothing on mine. There's an attachment sheet. So oh, okay. you, you see it says, uh, yeah. please see attached list. Yeah. These two here. Correct. Yeah. Right yep. Okay. The touch one, is that page 50 or 57? I believe yeah. so. Yes, it is. Yeah. Any further discussion? Yeah. All in favor say aye. Jess? I think Jess just said she wants to leave the meeting. She's not going really long. Okay. Judy? Yes. Aye. Gary? Aye. Brian? Aye. Uh, four zero motion is passed. Next one. I'll make a motion that we do the errors and mission on current use changes. Okay, I have a motion by Brian. Do I have a second? Second. By Gary. <coughs> Any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. G Judy? Thumbs up. <coughs> Thumbs up, Judy. Yeah. Gary. Aye. Brian. Aye. And I'm aye as well. Six. Motion is passed. Six. Six. Four zero. All right. Next item. I'm trying to sign and do all this at the same time. Um, hire a new EMS staff member. Bill, can you help me with that? Sure. Um, uh, myself, Corey, Eric, and uh, Paula at Human Resources met with four candidates. Uh, they understand that. Uh, based on those interviews, of four very qualified uh, uh, candidates that would, uh, any one of them would be able to step in and uh, perform at the workforce. Uh, uh, we would like to offer the, uh, the recently approved full time position in the Cold Mass. Um, uh, as a uh, starting rate of 19 to 12 an hour, but the start date of January 3rd. Okay. And Colby is here tonight. How are you? How are you? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you were. <laughs> Good. Apparently, we don't want to want to see you if you can't hear us. Thank you. All right, do we hear a motion regarding this? Sarah. I move to offer the position of full time EMS AEMT to Colby Massick at grade four, step three at 1912 per hour. I have a motion by Gary. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Brian. Is there any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. Judy? Thumbs up. Brian? Uh, Gary? <laughs> aye. Brian? Aye. I might as well. Four zero. The motion is passed. Welcome aboard. He said, "Welcome aboard." Well, <laughs> 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 
Just we are going to be we're going to be hosting the part time position is open. So we'll be back at some point to discuss those part time. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, next, approve revised fiscal year 22-23 compensation, compensation pay plan is right here. So as a result, uh, with Kobe coming on board, not necessarily just because of Kobe coming on board, we had discussed this prior. We just had not taken the time to, to, to ferret it out. But certainly there is a, a difference in the education levels between a certified paramedic and a certified AEMT. And in an attempt to recognize that, where on the former pay scale they were all lumped into one scale, uh, I, I'm uh, suggesting that the board uh, approve this to show the separation of the two with a, a pay difference uh, for the paramedic being higher uh, than the AEMT. That's uh, and that's that's one of the corrections that was being made. The other one. Uh, the other two actually are relative to your finance department. As I've mentioned numerous occasions, we are uh, very, very steadfastly working toward the formalized human resources department and processes and policies related to that. As a result of that, uh, the responsibilities of both Paula and Tina are greatly increased along with uh, the education needs. Paula comes to us having worked prior at a very large nonprofit, uh, and she was the human resources director. So she has a tremendous amount of knowledge in that field. Uh, it is a continuing education field, so they will have to continue to be trained and go to, to their classes on that. But in recognizing the fact that they are both working finance and HR at the same time, um, I felt that it was appropriate for us to uh, change their locations on the pay scale. Their, certainly their level of responsibility will, will and has increased greatly. Uh, so you can see the assistant finance HR director, they, they asked me to uh, just talk about this as positions, folks. They, this, uh, this team is pretty humble. They wanted me to discuss this as positions, but I think it's appropriate that you know, even after we've had the our first article tonight where we had a uh, no findings report from our auditor yet again. Um, I think it's important that we do recognize that these are the two folks that we're talking about impacting here on the work that they do. So uh, Paula's position moves up in line with the planning director or the zoning administrator's position as far as pay scale goes. And the finance director, HR director moves up in line with the same scale as the ENS chief. Mm -hmm. That's good to me. Those are my recommendations. Any questions? Sound no. good? Sounds good to me. Do we need a motion? We do. The motion would be to approve yeah. the uh, there, yeah. this yeah. with yeah. Bob's signature. We only need one signature. Yeah. Yeah. I move that we approve the revised proposed compensation pay plan for fiscal year 2022-2023 as presented and authorize Bob to sign. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Brian. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Judy? Thumbs up. Gary? Aye. Brian? Aye. I might as well. Four zero motion to pass. Right, John Hancock. Thank you, ladies. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. I know you guys are very humble, both of you. We know you make things happen. You're like the wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. But it's all the wizards. All right. Next, approve the warrant. I make motion we approve them. I have a motion by Brian. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Gary. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Judy. Thumbs up. 
Gary? Aye. Aye. Brian? Aye. And I as well. Four to zero. Motion is passed. Board to approve. TA report. Eric. Yes, uh, many thanks on behalf of the, the employees of the town of Morristown to the select board and to the taxpayers for the uh, Hannaford's gift cards that were uh, distributed at the holiday before the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, they were certainly uh, very much appreciated and lots of positive comments about that. So thank you. Okay. The EMS you know, interviews, I can only mirror what Bill has already said. Four very good candidates from in-house it was wonderful to have that many in-house and so qualified. It did make it a little difficult uh, to, to bring the choice down. But uh, uh, I, I, I think personally, I think the right choice was made. And it, uh, there was much debate back and forth. So uh, I welcome Colby on board as well. Uh, we spent a long time prepping and then getting ready for and then attending the I-250 hearing last Thursday night. It was... Uh, uh, you know, an exercise in education for me, having never been through the process before, is about a four-hour meeting with a 15-minute break uh, at one point in the middle. And uh, the feeling from the, the town uh, team, well, the, our attorney, Brooke, and uh, engineer, Tyler, is that uh, it, it went very well. And uh, they're, they're still working very hard, putting stuff together. They, uh, uh, we're going to have a meeting later this is it this week or first of next week? I think I maybe Friday morning. That's it. It's Friday this week. Yeah. So we'll uh, continue to gather information and answer the commission's questions that were that remained unanswered um, after the after the hearing. So um, everything looks looks to be good. Um, actually, actually, it was uh, some ple very pleasant surprises during the hearing too. So more on that as the as it unfolds. Uh, I attended the, the GPAC meeting, it's a, the Governor's Emergency Preparedness uh, Advisory Council meeting. Uh, I represent the, the Leagues of Cities and Towns at that meeting. Um, I'm uh, in an education process on that one as well, so I do a whole lot of listening. But it's uh, briefings at a higher level, um, with a lot of the uh, state folks there, um, senior leaders within uh, the National Guard and other components of the state government that have been chosen to be on this. And uh, they, they spoke, uh, we had a briefing from uh, out of Washington, D.C. on the, the uh, supply chain issues and how that related to or relates to our ability to respond at, uh, you know, at, at the end of a crisis or an environmental event. You know, what might we do? So there's a lot of thought process going on right now about what items would be you know, those necessary items after a flood event that which ha hits us or ice storms or long power outages. So, a lot of folks put a lot of thought into what items of necessity would be, but really, I think the message that comes out of that that I can pass on to our folks is if there was ever a time to build a, a uh, emergency box or emergency backpack or a, a go bag at home, now is the time to do that. Um, it's, the, the supply chain has had interruptions starting across the globe. And, uh, and in this country, um, so it's I'm not trying to get a run on toilet paper again. However, it's not a bad idea to just to you know, buy another roll of paper towels when you're at the store or some more canned soup, something like that. Just, just have supplies on hand, no different than what we've ever done as Vermonters, but just pay particular attention because if there are supply chain issues, issues that are gonna impact us going forward, to boost the price of fuels. Um, we had two retirement gatherings this last couple of weeks, one for uh, Richard Keith, one for Doug Wallace, uh, both of them well attended uh, in, in their own right, the way they wanted it done. Doug was a more reserved, Richard's pretty reserved too, but he didn't get much of a choice. But uh, it was a beautiful ceremony for him, uh, well attended. Uh, Doug wanted it uh, low key with the highway garage folks. He, uh, his wishes were met. It was a great, uh, great event there as well. And uh, both of them very, very grateful uh, for the send offs that they received. Um, other than that, I just continue to work on the projects that are a bit in front of us hazard mitigation and uh, local emergency management plans, uh, your animal control officer position, uh, just uh, trying to spend a little bit of time on everything as we go forward to keep the motion going in the right direction. That's all I have. Okay. Any questions for Eric? 
Okay. Judy? Thumbs up. <coughs> no questions. <laughs> okay, Eric, right, thank you. Next, select board concerns. Judy, can you talk or can you type? You don't have any? You have no speaker, no voice. Okay. Gary, save it for next time, Judy. We'll let her go twice next time. <laughs> yeah, I guess we get the thumbs up, so we're good to go. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, it, it tests your patience to go through an Act 250 hearing. Uh, I've been through a few. And I could just imagine what Eric was going through, just trying to to listen to some of the comments and stuff. It, it's just ridiculous. And I just want to give kudos to Eric with his silver tongue and the Act 250 team for kind of just pulling all this stuff together. They talked with two, well, they talked to one of the opponents, the biggest opponent, previous to the hearing and and that opponent in turn talked to another one at that 15 minute break that we had and it turned things around it was it was a sight to behold to see the one commissioner that had all the questions and when it comes to water supply and water management issue that had all been settled before the meeting. And she was dumbfounded. She had, she was on Zoom, but I know she had a list of questions up on that she was gonna ask. And she could not say a word because everything had been addressed and the opponent was Mr. Avery. He did an excellent job. He stood behind us 100%. It came to not weed issue that the same commissioner was pushing hard. And Mr. Avery, he, he said to the commission members, there's, if you want to make the town eradicate the not weed on this project, we'll probably bankrupt the town. Because he said, I've got it in my field down there. He said, I've done everything I can do for the last 40 years. 40 years to keep that at bay. And he said it still keeps encroaching. Every year it gets worse and worse and worse. And he's been fighting it with herbicides, which he doesn't like to do because he's a very organic type person. And, uh, but anyway, so I think they really took that to heart. The commissioners that were here at the table, really, you could see in their eyes that they, because that's all you could see because everybody was wearing masks. But, um, you could tell, and they they all did such an excellent job. Uh, <laughs> when I came in, Don Avery asked me, he said, Gary, yeah. said, are you here to testify? And I said, absolutely not, no. I'm just here as a spectator. And I don't know how good, bad, or different, but <laughs> I think it was, <laughs> yeah, I think it was a duty thumbs up. Yeah. But I wasn't testifying, but uh, no, it was great. I think we're going to get a favorable uh, we're going to have conditions, but that's what the team is working on. And our meeting is about on Friday morning is to draw up conclusions and finding the fact, conclusions of law and finding the fact, to present to the board. It's better for proactive, and we present them to them and let them modify them as they see fit, as mm -hmm. opposed to letting them decide. take the wheel and deciding <coughs> what we're going to have for conditions. So, uh, yeah, it worked really well. Uh, I know it's been a long time coming, and it, and like I say, for those of you that weren't there, which is all of you, I guess, other than myself and Eric, uh, it it really went really well uh, in my experience with Act Two Fifty hearings. Uh, I think it could have been a lot worse. Of course, we haven't seen the conditions yet, but we'll. I think we got a. I think we'll get a permit and a decent one to work with. And Kevin and everybody is on board with it. And 
Yeah, I think we're I think we're off to a good start, and we should hopefully we can use all our own material next year. We'll have to we'll have to work hard in order to be able to get our sand screen in time. But I think with a little uh, pushing and a little extra work, I think we can make it happen. So we don't have to purchase anything. Hopefully, out of town this year. Um, That's great. But, uh, yeah, it was good, and and I get I was just going to mention the Chiefs Retirement Party, which was very well attended, and uh, also Doug just and I presented him with uh, that letter that we all signed. It was framed thanks to probably Sarah. Eric said he got framed, but. <laughs> I did get that one. I did get that for She gets everything else. I can tell you that. Yeah. Sarah is my. Uh, but uh, she's my order. That no, was that was good. Yeah. I really appreciated it. A uh, couple of employees thought very highly of him, and one got a little emotional as uh, the speech went on that he gave, and uh, it was it was great. It was there. Everybody was uh, very appreciative, and and so was Doug. Pretty much shit for me, I guess. <clears throat> Thanks, Gary. Brian. Okay, I want to start by thanking everybody that gave me the flowers and the card. Very much appreciated. Sorry I missed both of the parties. I was at work. Um, one thing I noticed, it's getting darker earlier at night. I mentioned lights over by Hannaford's at the end of both road. Has anybody ever checked in there whether something, usually you come into an intersection, you got a big bright light kind of shine into, so you can see, and that's kind of dark through there on both ends. Both mean Safford Avenue and Hanford and uh, Brooklyn Street? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, the bypass and in, in the Hanover side, yeah, the Brooklyn, yeah. I, I can check with AOT on it. I, I'm, that's their, they, it's currently they own those roads, so the lighting would have to, I think, would come through them. Okay. Um, but I, I can check. I can call the ocean. Just see if it, it just it's normal. If you go up through there, you'll see all of the, a lot of the big, big intersections have lights that kind of light it up so you can see better. It's just a little dark there. Other than that, it's great. Okay. And I'm all set tonight. All right. Other business. <clears throat> Discuss evaluation of a public officer possible executive session. I make a motion to enter executive session to discuss appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. Pursuant to 1 BSA section 313 for N4 of the Vermont statute. Motion to include Eric Dodge standing Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Judy. Judy, I'm calling. Yes, aye. Aye. Judy, would you call my cell phone, Brian? Hi. 